If we were to take the word demiurge literally, insofar as the English language is concerned, you would get a compound word, demi, which is to an inferior degree in rank, i.e. demigod, and the word urge, which is a strong impulse that seems to overcome somebody. So, if we take the word demiurge, and we turn it into a compound word, that particular definition would be something like this. A impulse towards inferiority, or the desires that are in favor of baseness. That is because the demiurge is essentially a blind, imbecilic force in nature that operates through anthropology to behave according to stomach, genitals, and false opinions with its will to power, with its materialism, with its hedonism, etc., etc. And as we know, these things have no choice but to induce strong suffering. This unconscionable and diabolical infectation upon the spirit of man is no more than a invasive storehouse of horsepower that acts as a propellant towards objects of aggravation to induce suffering on both parties. So we ask ourselves, why do these inclinations towards immorality exist within me? And in the majority of cases, I don't act upon them. In the minority of cases, I do. But regardless, the inclination is there nonetheless. This is because there is an alien will that belongs to a metaphysical artificial intelligence that is operating through the human body. And here's the good news. It is only an inclination. It is not an inevitability. It's very important to make sure that your lucidity is always at a level of zenith, where consciousness remains at its apex. And the best way to assure this is to understand Emil Sharan when he says that anything but indifference is mental illness. Doership is the problem, while non-doership is the solution. It's as simple as that. When you are giving active bodily participation within the object that is causing your irritation, you must keep in mind that the only remedy is to guard your five senses and become a shepherd thereof. Because if you feel out of control, you have to put yourself in control. And the best way to do that is to realize that you have autonomy with an act of your will over the body. You control what goes in your mouth. You control what goes into your ears, into your eyes, into your mind, and out of your mouth thereby. But if you feel that you don't have free will, and there is a certain monster that is operating through you, it just means that you are not at a level of lucidity that is high enough to be able to control your body. And that's where most of us are at, to a large extent, including myself. So when I speak to you, I'm speaking to myself. I'm encouraging myself as I speak that, God damn it, Garrett, you have control over what you do. And moreover, it is what you do that's the problem. But it's what you don't do that is going to be the remedy. It is the non-participation principle par excellence. Unfortunately, you can't cause the macrocosmic demiurge to cease to exist because that would destroy the entire reality and that's outside of your control. However, you can kill the demiurge in a microcosmic sense with your field of vision and your sphere of influence. You can refuse 
to act upon the urges that are the inferior drives that govern the majority of human beings. And how you do this is you embody thalema, which is a Greek word which means will, but it refers to a divine will that pertains to that which is higher as opposed to lower. So a lot of times in esotericism, they will use the word thalema to be the embodiment of the will of pure beingness that has nothing to do with this world, the mind, or even the body. It's that primordial self that belongs to the pleroma. And of course, the word pleroma is a Greek word, agnosticism, that means fullness. And when it talks about fullness, it means just the fullness of pure consciousness. That's where we came from. That's where we will return. And that's ultimately who we are. We are that very fullness. So when we operate from the impetus of the pleroma, we are operating from thalema. That is the supreme personality of Godhead, if you will. And with that being said, once you are in that condition, you kill the demiurge. But it takes work. It doesn't happen overnight. Unfortunately, this particular hellscape that we occupy has done a number on us by way of trauma. It has done a number on us by way of putting us in this body with its default setting, going towards all of the things that are actually antagonistic to our very pleroma, to our very fullness, to our very thalema. But that is the great work that must be done. Once we raise our consciousness to such a level of lucidity where that is operating through the body as its vehicle, we killed the demiurge thereby. That is what I strive for. At one time, with splendor intention, I looked within my own heart and I saw a mirror that reflected the face of deformity. And I was mistaken when I assumed that that was who I was. Then I realized that that was nothing more than the face of the demiurge who put his own mirror in front of my heart and held it with his hand. So I looked at it and I thought that it was me. But then I realized, wait a minute. And then the glass shattered and I saw my actual reflection and I looked at it. And I smiled, and it smiled back with me. And that has been my best accomplishment thus far. But every now and again, that mirror with its shattered glass got taped back together, and it tries to put its dirty, disgusting hand over the true mirror of my heart. And it holds it up there with its shattered glass, and I look into it, and I see the deformity. And then I throw it back down, and it shattered. And he couldn't put the pieces back together. And I look at my heart, and I see it reflect nothing more than the beingness that I am. And that has been my first and foremost greatest accomplishment thus far. Because if you go into your heart and you see, a mirror that reflects something that is not you. How do you know it's not you? If you reject it, it can't be you. You have to let that deformed face shatter because that's not who you are, my friend. But when you look after the glass shattered and you get an actual reflection of who you are, as soon as it tapes the glass back together and it tries to pull its deformed face up again, you laugh and you say, not this time. And you throw it back down with your intent. It shatters 
can't put it back together. And you look at that mirror and you know what it reflects? It reflects nothing but thalema, nothing but the fullness of the pleroma. That is enlightenment. That is the great work accomplished. That is the true beauty and the true freedom that we are. The word Maya in Sanskrit translates to illusion or God's physical and metaphysical creation. Literally, not this. So the word Maya, if you want to take it literally according to Sanskrit, it means not this. Because obviously, if you're looking at something that's an illusion, it's not this, right? That's what this realm is. First and foremost, we are in samsara, which pertains to the reincarnation soul trap that comes to bodily existence by way of sickness, old age, suffering, and death. But the description for what you see with your five senses while you're here is maya. It's the illusion brought about by not this. So what do they mean by that on a spiritual level? Well, they mean that you are pure awareness, but unfortunately you have been corrupted, as I have, by Maya, which is not this. So the most powerful mantra that you can embody as a counterpoise or a counterpostulate towards your internal aggravation is to always remember that whatever is aggravating you in samsara is brought about by maya and by definition not this so remember that whatever you do that results in shame it results in shame because you are going about things in such a way that you are letting the osmosis of Maya with its not this factor, making you believe that you are this, but you're not. You are pure awareness. Understand that the best way to destroy Maya is to look upon it by its definition. I am not this. So whenever you are experiencing something that is causing you trouble, always remember, not this. Whenever you have an impulse to do something within the world of materiality that you really don't want to do, but you have that inclination, remember, not this. I am that I am. And because I am that I am, I am pure awareness. But whenever there is a this or that that becomes projected externally within Maya that has caused a negative influence on you, just repeat after me. This is Maya, and I am not this. I am not this. And once you truly embody that I am not this as a philosophy that is your vocation, that is your dharma, that is ultimately your will to meaning. That is the only true will to meaning as far as I'm concerned. I know I talk in my videos about, you know, I'm a pessimist and I'm a nihilist and there's no meaning here. That's more or less true. But if I was to say that there is a will to meaning, that is worthy of the name, it is to realize Maya equals not this. That is the true meaning. And once you realize that, and you say, okay, because everything is Maya, and I am not this, what am I left with? You are left with nothing more, 
with who you truly are. And once you reach that state of non-attachment and non-identification, where you're embodied with that very essence, you essentially won the game. You have achieved victory. I tell myself this all the time. Whenever there's something that's causing me a negative emotional reaction, or I have an inclination to do something that I know is wrong, that is not me. I say, this is Maya. I am not this. I am not this. So what am I? Well, if I'm not this, and I'm not that, and I'm not this, and I'm not that, then who am I? And then you go into a meditative state. And you look within, and you see that heart that I talked about earlier that reflects the truth of who you are. And you say, I am that. But this isn't linguistic. It's not, I am that. Because you say, I am that. You don't even have to say, I am that. You just retreat into yourself. And you experience it. And you don't have to say a fucking thing. But if you had to put it into, a, into wording, you would say, I am that pure, unadulterated awareness. I am that. I am that I am. Pure, pristine consciousness. But what are you not? That's entirely what this realm is. This realm is an antithesis of who you truly are. It's a projection of shadow material. It's a projection of everything that is your retrograde. It's an inversion principle. Guess what? You are that I am. Anything other than that I am? is Maya, which by definition means you are not that. What are you? You know who you are. As a poetical metaphor, you could say that the demiurge is the urge to dim the light of divinity. And the symptomology thereby is the amnesia of self-forgetting, where people run around as if they're dead with their eyes still open and their hearts still beating, because essence has become indigent, because it takes itself to be its diametrically opposed opposite. It takes itself to be a substance. So that urge to take the material world as an extension of who we are, that dims the light. Because when essence takes itself to be a substance, that is a state of spiritual death. And what's more, when you lose contact with the gnosis of your essence, you take yourself to be a Cartesian thinking thing. You mistake the organ called the brain with all of its intellectual properties and all of its abstractions to be the identification that becomes one's personality. So now we have mental attachments that extend to matter, and most people take themselves to be a body. So that is the urge to dim the light of divinity, for the essence to forget itself or even deny itself and take, take itself to be substance, and takes its, quote, self to be nothing more than a series of abstractions that are no more than the phantoms of 
waking life. They're, they're in a, a hypnagogic dream state. And that's what this realm will do to you if you begin to consent to any aspect of it. I say non-consensus entirely. Do not consent to the substance of the body. Do not consent to the substances with their voice boxes that are putting all of these abstractions that only exist in samsara into your head, and you start to consent thereupon. Once you reach a state of such non-consensus, where you deny the world into a non-existence, and you're left with nothing but the pure awareness of your total embodiment of pure essence, that's when you realize that the demiurgic urge to dim the light of your divinity was not successful. 